Well, how about giving the worship team a round of appreciation today? They've done a great job, an excellent job. Mark chapter 9 in your Bibles. Let's move there as rapidly as possible for the sake of time. While you're looking there, either buy your hard copy or your digital copy, let me say thank you again for hosting our ministry on this celebratory weekend. We're headed into the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. And I am so appreciative of those of you that have not been absent from one service. But if this is your first service, thank you for being with us. It's been good to have my mom and dad extended family with me. They'll be returning to Quanta later this afternoon. And then I've got some special friends that drove all the way from Lubbock to hear me today. And uh, anybody that'll get up and drive 90 minutes, there are a lot of people who wouldn't drive nine seconds right here in town to come to church today. Did you hear me? I said, there are people who wouldn't drive nine blocks to come to church today. And they drove all the way from Lubbock to be with us in service today. And I appreciate that so very much. Pastor, thank you and your family. You've been very gracious and very kind host. And I appreciate the leadership that you have here Amen. and how they are taking this church forward. Mark chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading with the 46th verse. I will encourage you to keep whatever version of the Bible that you're studying from handy because we're going to visit number of passages this morning. Mark chapter 10. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your financial support of our ministry. We uh, as well have the media table out in the foyer. A number of you have already purchased some of the teaching product and I would encourage you to avail yourself to it and then be sure to return for our concluding service at 6 o'clock this evening. Mark 10 verse 46 and they came to Jericho and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people blind Bartimaeus the son of Timaeus sat by the highway side begging what a picture of humanity and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. You son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise, he calls you. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto him, What is it that you would have me do unto you? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now I want to minister for a few moments this morning on the subject of hearing, saying, and seeing. Hearing, saying, and seeing. What you hear will dictate what you say. And what you say will determine what you see. Amen. I said what you hear will dictate what you say. And what you say determines what you see. Father, the next few moments help us. As we investigate these various passages and we pray that you accompany the ministry, the vocalization of the Word today with the person, the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
I pray, Lord, that you will help the listeners today to be able to see whatever impossibility it is in their life that it has fulfillment in Christ. We'll ask it all in His name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. The time of our text is just before what theologians entitle or call the triumphal entry. That's what Pastor has referenced many times already this morning. As you study the latter portion of the 10th chapter of Mark's version of the Gospel, and then you begin reading the first verse of the 11th chapter, you're going to see that which we are commemorating this morning taking place as Christ is going to ride on the back of a donkey into the city of Jerusalem for the final time. He is on a collision course with the cross of Calvary. He is on His way to fulfill what we studied Friday night in great detail. He is on His way to fulfill all the prophecies. He is on His way to becoming the crowning jewel of Christianity. As He would hang on that cross, suspended between heaven and earth, bearing my sin, bearing your sin. And it's interesting to note, I posted on my social media account this morning, that a donkey carried the lamb into the city of Jerusalem. I said a donkey carried the lamb into the city of Jerusalem. I don't even want to take this sidetrack because my mind is so affixed to my text. But understand something about that donkey. That donkey owed its life to that lamb. Did you know that? If you study the Old Testament, you're going to find that lambs, according, I mean donkeys rather, according to their birth order, were, were literally redeemed by a lamb. You go study that out in the Old Testament and you'll find it. And that donkey literally owed his life to the Lamb of God that he bore on his back. And that all happens following the text that I read to you this morning. And the Bible says that as Jesus is making his way toward the city of Jerusalem, he is making his way toward this triumphal entry. That first, he goes through the city of Jericho. Now, theologians agree, they come into alignment, that in the three and a half year ministry of Christ, this was the first time that the Bible records that Jesus visited the city of Jericho. Did you get that? Three and a half years of ministry. He was 33 and a half years of age when he died. Three and a half years of public ministry. And this is the first time that the Bible records he has visited the city of Jericho. It's the first time that he as the Son of God has visited the city of Jericho. But it is not the first time that Jesus has been to Jericho. Well, I've come to preach this morning. You might as well settle in for a while. <laughs> Somebody said, I don't even get what you just said. Now stay with me. I said, it's the first time that the Son of God has visited the city of Jericho. But it's not the first time that Jesus, God, has been to Jericho. Understand something with me theologically this morning. Understand that Jesus was not always the Son of God. He has always been God, but He was born the Son of God. Be careful that you don't get off into an errant theological camp that you believe He's always been the Son of God, that you believe He proceeded from the Father. No, my Bible clearly teaches me that He being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The Son is in submission to the will of the Father, but understand, the Son is a co-equal with the Father. Amen. Yes. Understand that. He chooses to fall into alignment with the will, the desire of the Godhead, but He is an equal member of that Godhead. 
He being in the form of God, thought it not proper to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a servant and became clothed in human flesh. Jesus did not come into existence when he was birthed through the vehicle of the body of the Virgin Mary. No, he is the eternally existent second member of the triune Godhead. What did Jesus tell those religious leaders? He said to them, before Abraham was, I am. I am eternally existent. Before this world ever existed, what does the Bible teach us? It teaches us that by him, all things were made. All things exist in this world by him and for him. And nothing exists in this world without him. And this is the first time that he... Limited by human flesh as the Son of God went to the city of Jericho. But this is not the first time that he, as God, has been to the city of Jericho. Look in your Bibles with me at the Old Testament writing of Joshua. Joshua. While you're looking there, Joshua chapter 5, let me set some context for you because I want to draw a dichotomy. I want to draw a parallel. I want you to see the connection of this place in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is Jericho? Where is Jericho? Jericho is located some 10 to 12 miles from the city of Jerusalem. Jericho in your Old Testament would be the first city of the promised land. Remember, what did God promise Moses and three to six million Israelites? He promised them as he brought them out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage that I have a land for you to possess. It is the land that I promised to your father Abraham. And everywhere that the sole of your foot shall trod, you will possess that land. For 40 years, a generation has circled time and time again through the wilderness until now, at 120 years of age, Moses takes his last breath. He did not die from disease. He did not perish from illness. For the Bible tells us that at 120 years of age, his eye never waxed dim, nor was his natural strength diminished or decreased in any way. What does that mean? It means that at 120, he was as strong and as sharp as he was at 40. He did not die from age or the effects thereof, but God simply took the life out of the lawgiver and put, placed him in a a, a sepulcher that no man has discovered even to this day. God was the pallbearer for Moses, the lawgiver. Yeah. And now Joshua takes the reins and is getting ready to lead three to six million Israelites into the promised land. But Joshua is anxious. Joshua is filled with fear and nervousness and questions because he has always been the co-pilot in this journey. He's never occupied the driver's seat. Let me say something for you church people. It's easy for church people to, to, to determine the direction of the church from the second chair. Amen. Well, I told you I've come to preach. I said it's easy for people that love God immensely. But it's easy for people that sit out here in pews to think they know best for the direction of the church. Amen. Let me tell you something. Armchair quarterbacks are a dime a dozen. <laughs> I said you're a dime a dozen when people sit back and, and think, well, I know best. I can tell you when you occupy his chair, things are radically different. <laughs> when you're driving the bus, when you're flying the plane, yeah. all of a sudden you have a different perspective. Joshua's not sure. He's not sure. All he's ever known is the second chair. So God is going to do what? God is going to perform a miracle. Now catch this. God, the, the, the river Jordan stands between Joshua, the Israelites, and the promised land. 
The Jordan River is, at this particular time in history, at flood stage. And God is going to perform a miracle. God is going to have Joshua instruct the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders and to march down to the banks of that river and begin to walk out into those flooded waters. And as they progress into the flooded waters of the Jordan, God performs a miracle and rolls those waters back and allows these Israelites to march over on dry ground under the leadership, the administration, and the instruction of Joshua. Can you imagine what kind of affirmation and confirmation that must have served for both Joshua and the people? We were talking about confirmation and affirmation last night. Why did it serve as confirmation and affirmation? Because what miracle does that remind you of? It reminds me of the miracle when Moses led these people out 40 years earlier. And in that wilderness experience, all of a sudden, here comes Pharaoh and his horses and his chariots and his armies. And God parts the waters of the Red Sea and lets Israel walk over on dry ground. So God will use an identical miracle that marked the beginning of the ministry of Moses to now mark the beginning of the ministry of Joshua and say, just as I was with Moses, so am I with Joshua. So be strong and have a good courage. They walk over on this dry ground. And the first city that is to be taken, the first city that is to be possessed in this promised land is the city of Jericho. Remember, I told you, it's his first time to visit it under the constraints of human flesh. But it's not his first time to visit there. Joshua chapter 5, look at it with me. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said unto him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And the man responded, Neither, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said to him, What says my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose your shoe from off your foot, for the place whereon you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua is seeing a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ Jesus. Now what does that term mean, pre-incarnate? That is fancy theological talk for the fact that this was Jesus in an Old Testament appearance. This was Jesus before he clothed himself in human flesh through the virgin birth. Remember I told you, he did not come into existence when he was born through Mary. He has always and eternally existed. Somebody said, well, he doesn't identify himself as God. How do you know this was not an angel? Read the Bible and you'll know how to know. I said, read the Bible and you'll know how to know. How do I know this wasn't an angel? I know it's not an angel because Joshua fell on his face and began to worship. Yes. And that individual did not rebuke him. Yes. You'll read in the Bible where people tried to worship the apostles or people tried to worship angels. And what is their response? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't you worship us. There's only one that deserves worship. And that is God himself. He didn't stop him from worshiping. He went on and admonished him. Take your shoes off and worship. Because the ground whereon you stand is holy. Because the ground whereon you stand is now occupied by God himself. He's the captain of the Lord's host. So it's the first time in Mark that Jesus as a man visited the city of Jericho. But it's not the first time that Jesus has visited the city of Jericho. And he comes to Jericho. And notice with me in verse 6 of Joshua. <laughs> Joshua 6 and 1. Now Jericho 
was straightly shut up. Because of the children of Israel. None went out. And none came in. Isn't that interesting? Jericho is absolutely locked down. Nobody comes out. Nobody comes in. But notice the difference in our text in Mark chapter 10. Because the Bible says that Jesus comes into the city of Jericho and Jesus goes out of the city of Jericho. Now there's a dichotomy here. There's again a difference. And I want you to see the parallel because in the Old Testament, Jericho was locked down. Nobody went in. Nobody came out. Nobody made entrance. Nobody made exit. But when we find Jericho mentioned here in the New Testament, Jesus came in and Jesus went out. And if you know anything about these two stories, you'll see that there is a radical difference between what happened in the Old Testament and what happened in the New Testament. <laughs> Listen to me, saints. If we don't allow entrance... If we, so many people come to the house of God and they're locked down. Some of you come to the house of God. Some of you have been in this revival and you thought, you know what? With all the hype and all the promotion, he's really not that great of an evangelist. Let me tell you, number one, you're right. I'm not that great of an evangelist. But number two, I want you to consider this. Maybe you're not receiving anything in ministry because you're locked down. You're like Jericho. Nothing can get in and nothing can get out. Come on, saints. you got to be careful because if you lock down and you don't allow anything in and anything out, the outcome is going to be detrimental. It doesn't matter if it's a nation. It doesn't matter if it's a state. It doesn't matter if it's a city. It doesn't matter if it's a family. It doesn't matter if it's a church. It doesn't matter if it's you and I as individuals. We must have an opening. I said we must have an opening. And I'll lift up your gates, the psalmist said. Lift open the doors and let the King of glory come in. That's what the psalmist wrote. And if you and I will open our hearts, open our minds, and open our spirits, and let Jesus make entrance, I can promise you that when He makes exit, you're going to be far better off. After He's passed by, you'll be in a far better position than you were before He came. Jericho is shut down in the Old Testament. Nobody gets in and nobody gets out. Now notice how the text progresses here in Mark's version. There are a great number of people that are following Jesus as he's making his way toward the city of Jerusalem. The Bible says that there is a blind man. It calls him blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. He sat by the highway side begging. He sat by the highway side. Uh, there's so many things that I could preach. This is really a series of sermons, but let me just touch this for a moment. I find it interesting that the Spirit of God identifies this man first by his disability. Did you catch that? It doesn't say that his name was Bartimaeus, who was blind. It identifies him first by his disability. He is blind Bartimaeus. It's a perfect picture of the human race. And because of his blindness, he is positioned by the roadside or by the way. Every person born into the human race is born blind. Yes. Spiritually blind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of our blindness, we live our entire existence by the way. It's a position of begging. That's why he was by the way side. It was a position he was placed in daily where he could, he could beg for enough to make it one more day. But I want you to notice that at the conclusion of this encounter with our Lord, 
The Bible clearly says that he goes from being by the way to in the way. Yes, amen. I said he goes from being by the way. God never called you to be by the way. God called you to get in the way. Amen. Come on, saints. Amen. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. Amen. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yeah. I'm in the glory land way. Yeah. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way grows clear. I'm in the glory land way. Never called us to be by the way. He called us to be in the way. Amen. But we'll never be able to be in the way until we first have to deal with this blindness. Amen. Now stay with me. And this, this blind man sits by the highway side. The verse 47 says, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he can't see but he can hear. Amen. And what he hears is going to radically impact what he says. Amen. And what he says is going to determine what he sees. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, now there's, a, there's another parallel here that I want you to see. It says when he heard that it was Jesus. Look with me again in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. I'm trying to draw these parallels for you from the Old Testament. Now, now prior, to, prior to Joshua leading the children of Israel into Jericho, the Bible says that Joshua is going to send two spies into that city. Now this is interesting to me. I'll have to preach sometime in the future if the Lord allows me on the subject of Rahab and the city of Jericho because if we're not careful we will misinterpret the purpose or the mission of these two spies. Two spies are getting ready to take the city of Jericho and two spies go in and if we're not careful we will think that the mission of these two spies was to go in as intelligence agents. To go in as spies just you know, uh, mining out data, mapping out the city, saying here's the strong points, here are the weak points, there's so many troops on this wall, so many troops on this wall, this would be the best place to attack, this would be the worst place to attack. But that's not the purpose of their mission at all. How do I know that? I know that because God's not going to deliver the, deliver the city of Jericho to the Israelites through any kind of natural military means. Amen. God's going to deliver the city of Jericho supernaturally. Yes. I said, God, God doesn't need two spies to go in there and find out what's in there. God already knows what's in there. Yeah. Amen. Come on, saints. Yeah. So the purpose of the spies was not to mine out information. No, really, the purpose of the spies was to mine out a woman by the name yes. of Rahab. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> You got a woman of ill repute. You got a woman of poor reputation. You've got a woman who is a prostitute by occupation. A prostitute by occupation. And she's going to take these spies into her home. And notice what is said in Joshua chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says, Before they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Catch that now. I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the, your terror is fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Now how did she know? She says she knows in verse 9. She's going to tell you how she knows in verse 10. For we have heard. You didn't get that. I'm talking about what you hear changes what you say, and what you say determines what you see. She said, I know that God's going to give you this city. And I know He's not going to stop with just giving you this city, but He's going to give you this entire land. 
And the way that I know that God is going to do this is because we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. We have heard when you came out of Egypt, God did that mighty miracle. And we have heard what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Verse 11, And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because for you, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. So what she heard produced a knowledge. Yes. You need to stay with me. What she heard produced the knowledge in her life. And that knowledge that was produced would serve as saving faith so that Rahab and all of those in her house would not be consumed when the Israelites overran the city of Jericho. Now we fast forward 1,500 years. I said now we fast forward 1,500 years and we find a blind man in the same city sitting by the roadside begging. But when he heard that it was Jesus. Yes, amen. Something about hearing. I addressed it last yeah. night. Hearing has a direct connection to the soul or the spirit of man. And isn't it interesting? Isn't it ironic? Isn't it intriguing how different people hear the same thing but respond radically different? Yes. Listen. Rahab said, not I have heard, we have heard. Everybody in this city has heard what God has done for you. Everybody in this city has heard the testimony of how God is delivering and moving on your behalf. But although everybody in the city of Jericho heard, only one lady chose to believe what she heard. I said only one lady chose to believe what she heard. That is the mystery of the gospel. I said that is the mystery of the gospel. People sit in services and hear the same gospel preached under the same anointing. Words falling from the same lips of an orator that stands behind the pulpit. Yet they respond so differently. Some choose to hear and believe. Some choose to hear and reject. But what you hear, what you let get in, I said what you let get in is going to radically change you. Look with me at Romans chapter 10 quickly. I know I'm taking you to a lot of text and I'm doing so intentionally because I want you to see how this all threads together. Romans chapter 10, a very common passage of scripture. Romans chapter 10, verse number 13. For whosoever shall call or say Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? Yeah. Notice he is systematically walking it back. He's saying you have to say something in order to be saved. You have to say, you have to pronounce, you have to call, you have to prophesy, you have to speak the name of the Lord. But how can you say anything or call upon the name of the Lord unless you first believe? And how can you believe unless you first hear? Yeah. Hearing impacts what you say. Yes, amen. And saying determines what you see. Amen. Understand, that seems, uh, that seems so out of place. Because in the natural Seeing is believing. I said in the natural, seeing is believing. But in the kingdom, in the supernatural, believing is seeing. The roles are actually reversed. So she heard. I said so she heard. Or he heard, rather. He heard. So did she. It's referencing Rahab. But the blind man hears. Now what he heard 
we don't know exactly. What we do know, the Bible specifies, is that he heard that Jesus was passing by. Now, we can make some assumptions. We don't know if those assumptions are correct. The assumptions that we can make is we can make assumptions that maybe he's heard the reputation of Jesus. Maybe he's heard how Jesus healed all who were sick and oppressed of the devil. Maybe he's heard how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Maybe he's heard how Jesus touched the coffin of the widow named son and the boy lived again. Maybe he's heard how Jesus took a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish and multiplied them and fed 5,000. Maybe he's heard all of these things and they have built his faith. But what we know Oh, for sure is that he heard right then that Jesus was passing by. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, he could not see, but he could hear. There are many of you that sit under the sound of my voice this morning and you can't see. I said there are things in your life that you, can, you can't see how God is going to heal you of heart disease or you can't see how God's going to deal with your cancer. You can't see how God's going to heal you of this, that, or the other. But have you heard that by His stripes you are healed? Because if you hear right, if you hear right, it'll change what you say, which will impact what you see. Some are here and you can't see how you're going to make it fiscally. You can't see how you're going to make it financially. The nation is in this financial peril. And if you don't believe that, check your account. That's why they're sending everybody money because the nation is teetering on a financial collapse. That's why they keep printing bills and sending them out. Which in all actuality, I'm not here to teach on finances. It's not helping the situation. It's making it worse. You can celebrate those $1,400 checks that you just got. What you're not understanding is those the $1,400 checks, those dollars aren't worth but about a quarter. That's why they got to send you so many of them. Because of inflation, they won't buy anything. That's why they got to write you a big check because the dollar's not worth anything. Y'all come on, help me right there. I say, come on, help me right there. Oh, we think it's so wonderful. They're giving us so many dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You go down to South America and find that. You'll see where money in South America is just on the streets because it's worthless. Yeah. Worthless. That's what happens. Maybe you can't see how you're going to make it financially. You can't see, you can't see, you can't see. But have you heard? Yeah. Have you heard that he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provides? Yeah. Have you heard that I have been all the young and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread? Maybe you're here and you're, you're saying, I can't see how God's going to deliver me from my depression and my anxiety and my fear. But have you heard that the joy of the Lord is your and that he is peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm telling you what you hear changes what you say. And what you say determines what you see. Can't see. But he hears. He hears that Jesus is passing by. And when he hears this, what's his response? He began to cry out. And say. Because what you hear dictates what you say. Yeah, it does. You need to heighten your sense of hearing. Amen. Yeah. And he began to say, Jesus, you son of David, have mercy on me. Now understand exactly what this vocal proclamation communicated. What he is in essence saying is you, sir, are the Messiah. Yes. Now keep all of this chronologically in your mind. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's about to make the triumphal entry. He's about to fulfill his prophetic purpose. And along the way, for the first time in his earthly ministry, he comes to the city of Jericho. And this blind man which cannot see hears that Jesus is passing by and begins to say, Messiah, 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 Messiah. Woo. Hallelujah. Glory. I said hallelujah. Yeah. Now remember the parallel that I drew 
through that I drew a moment ago to Jericho in the Old Testament. Remember, I talked to you about Rahab and her family and how they were saved. Remember what they said. They said, listen, lady, you just let us down out of here. Make sure we get out of here safe. And she used a scarlet rope to let them down. And they said, listen, just let this rope dangle out here. Let this rope, let this scarlet rope serve as a true token. This rope will mark the place so that when everybody else is getting killed and when we're running through this place and, and we're ridding this place of all of these sinful, godless people, the only thing that's going to save you and your house is that scarlet ribbon, that scarlet rope, that scarlet thread. And when the walls of Jerusalem, the ground opened up and the walls of Jerusalem just sank down until the, the, the walls were level with the ground. And then the armies of the Israelites came in. But they did no harm to the home of Rahab because of that scarlet cord, which represents the blood of Christ, and the covenant that they had cut with her or that they had made with her. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 1 that this, this, this woman of ill repute, this woman of wickedness, this woman that was a prostitute. This woman, a woman of the night. You can say so many bad things about her, but notice where you find her mentioned in that New Testament. Yeah. She's going to be there in Matthew chapter 1. Yeah. The first gospel, the first chapter, when the lineage of Jesus is being described, when it's talking about the descendants, uh, uh, and, and all of a sudden you're going to find that this woman of ill repute is listed there in the lineage of Christ. She is a great grandmother of our Lord, many times removed. I said she's a great grandmother of our Lord, many times removed. She was one that was used to bring the Messiah into existence. And then, right here in Mark, we find that this blind man who cannot see but has heard that Jesus is passing by, lifts up his voice and begins to say, Messiah, Messiah, thou son, that's what he meant, thou son of David, you're the son of Abraham, you're the, you're the son of David, you're the son of Rahab. Messiah, 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 Messiah. He's saying it, he's saying it, he's saying it. Uh, What you hear impacts what you say. The very next chapter, Mark chapter 11, one of, the most, one of the most quoted passages concerning faith in the Bible. Jesus said, whatsoever you say, you'll have it. I know there's been a lot of abuses through the years. I know, I know there's been a lot of hyper faith teaching that has taken particular verses out of context and, and misquoted them and used them uh, for selfish means. But let me just say this. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin were not the originators of that particular phraseology. Jesus was. Amen. I understand abuses, but I understand that Jesus was the one that said, whatsoever yep. you say, Amen. you shall have. That's what he Come on, saints. Yeah. He said right there, you shall speak to this mountain and say to it, be removed and cast into the sea. And whatever you say to that mountain, it will do. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he's, he's, he's saying, Messiah, 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 Messiah. And the text says that the crowd there in Jericho tried to silence him. The crowd in Jericho attempts to, to silence him. Uh, let, me, let me show you something. Let me go home. Jesus, help me. What you hear impacts what you say. What you say determines what you see. Here's a blind man who sees nothing. But yet he is vocally proclaiming, this is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. 
Not long ago in studying for this sermon, I was on a website, I think it dealt with optometry. And the website had two definitions, one for sight, one for vision. Some of you say, well, they're synonymous, they're the same thing. No, they're not. I said, no, they're not. Listen to me. The website defines sight as the ability to see a fixated object. The ability to see a fixated object. The website went on to define vision as understanding what you have seen. Mm -hmm. oh, Come on. Sight. The man had none. Yeah, but he had vision. Did you get that? <laughs> Sight, the man had none. That's what he's going to ask from, for the Lord or from the Lord in just a few moments. He had no sight, yet he had vision. Yes, amen. He had no ability to see, but he had understanding. This man is the Messiah. Yes. This man is the promised of old. Come on, saints. in your Bibles. Look with me in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 11. Let me show you something quickly. Hebrews chapter 11. Everybody knows Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 1 or almost everybody knows Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 1. We know what the Bible teaches us about, about uh, the definition of faith. But let me, let me play with the words if I might for just a few moments this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Get this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Let me change one word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the vision of things not seen. You and I live entrapped by what we see or more specifically in context by what we do not see. I said we live trapped by what we see and more specifically what we do not see. But what we've got to learn in the kingdom is that you can have vision before you see it. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 1 in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 18. Turn there with me quickly. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 18. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 1 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory of the glory of his inheritance is for the saints did you know that your understanding has eyes my god i'm preaching better than you did yeah, hands are acting <laughs> i said did you know that your understanding has eyes Come on, saints, your understanding. What's he talking about? He's talking about the mind, the heart, the soul of man. It's not a matter of just what your physical eyes see and receive. It's your eyes of your understanding. That's exactly what's happening here with blind Bartimaeus. Physically, he saw nothing. I said physically, he saw nothing. But on the inside, in his spirit man, with the eyes of his understanding, he caught a glimpse of who this man was and he understood the riches of his glory that were possessed in Christ Jesus. It's the same thing that happened with Peter. Jesus is sitting with his disciples. He said, whom do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're Jeremiah resurrected. Some say you're Elijah resurrected. Some think you're this prophet. Some think you're that prophet. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? Peter said, I believe you are the Christ. I believe you are the Messiah. I believe you are the promised one of the Old Testament. I believe you are the Son of God. And what did Jesus respond and say? He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood. Your natural sight has not served to reveal this to you, but it has been revealed to you by my Father which is in heaven by the working of the Holy Spirit you have had the eyes of your understanding enlightened come on ladies and gentlemen that's exactly what happened to Bartimaeus he couldn't see anything in the physical but what he heard determined what he said and on the eye inside with the eyes of his understanding open he said you're the Messiah you're the Son of God you're the one we've been looking for And they said, shh, be quiet. Shut up. Yeah. Shut up. 
I've heard people preach and teach this and, 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 and read behind writers and all oh, the crowd silenced the, the blind man. And, I mean, think of who's in this crowd. You've got the disciples and the followers of Jesus. And, and, and it never made sense to me why would that group try to suppress the cry of this blind man. It never made sense to me. Until recently in my studies, I came across the understanding that the city of Jericho, during this particular day, during the, during the, the rulership of Herod, the city of Jericho had a very large population of priests. <coughs> Did you get that? I said they had a very large population of priests. The Talmud of, of Jewish writing teaches that half of the priests would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the annual feast. And the other half of the priests would stay in Jericho, and they would make all the supplies and everything needed and send them up the road for service. So there's a large population, there's a large residency of priests in this city. Now these are your religious leaders. Get it. These are your religious leaders. If anybody should have known who this man was, it was those priests. I said, if anybody should have known, if anybody knew the writings of the Old Testament prophets, if anybody knew the prophecies that had been given hundreds of years before, if anybody should have recognized this is the promised one, this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah for which we have been waiting, it should have been those priests. But isn't it interesting that the Bible does not record that those priests understood who he was. Rather, the Bible records a blind man understood who he was. And I tell you, there are a lot of religious people that sit in church and they don't have any idea when God is moving, when God is present, when God is absent. They don't have a clue what's going on. But it's funny to me, you can let a few blind people stagger in here. I said, yeah. It's funny to me that saints that are supposed to be sanctified and separated and full of the Holy Ghost sit there like knots on trees and are unmoved and untouched. But you let a drunk, you let a drug addict, you let somebody that's lost and undone and searching for an answer stagger in here. And they respond radically different than religious folks will. Isn't that interesting? The religious crowd did not know who he was. Really, in actuality, they did not deal with that, but they, that's what's happening here. He's crying out. Jesus is passing by, and he's crying out, The Messiah! The Messiah! The Messiah! And those priests said, Shut up! Don't you say he's the Messiah. That's blasphemous! Be silent! Say that no more! This man is a Nazarene! This man is the son of a carpenter! We know who the Messiah is, and this ain't him! That's what's happening here. I said, that's what's happening here. Matthew, look at, look at Matthew chapter 13. Let me show you what, the, what Jesus teaches. I'm done in just a few moments. All some of you can think about is, 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 is chicken fried steak, right? You can look at me and tell food doesn't mean much to me. Matthew chapter 13. Turn there with me quickly. Matthew chapter 13. Look it up in your smart device. Verse number 9. Jesus is speaking. Matthew 13 verse 9. He... Or who has ears to hear? Jesus said, anybody that's got an ear to hear, let him hear. And the disciples in verse 10 came and said to him, Why speak you to them in parables? Now get this. The disciples come to Jesus. Jesus has just taught a large multitude. And in that multitude, a lot of times, the people that came to, heard Jesus, to hear Jesus, a lot of times were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests. They're always coming to hear him and, and they're always trying to catch him in something. <clears throat> and these disciples that ran with Jesus all the time, they, they in essence come and say, Lord, when it's just you and us, you just talk to us plain. Yeah. Anybody can understand it. But then when these religious people gather up, you start talking in riddles. You start talking in parables. Why do you do that? Jesus, verse 11, answered, said to them, Because it is given up to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. Verse 12, For whosoever has, to him shall it be given. 
And he shall have more abundance, but whosoever has not from him, it shall be taken, even what he has. Verse 13, therefore speak I to them in parables. Get this, I speak to them in parables because they see. See not. See not. They see, they should know, but they don't. They have eyes to see, but they see nothing. And hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand. Oh. I'm talking about the eyes of your understanding. Verse 14, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which say, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Mm. They said, shh, be quiet. Don't call him the Messiah. And Jesus does what? The Bible says Jesus stops. Yeah. Stood still. Now get what's happening. You got a blind man. I mean, he's on his way. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's got a crowd of, of he's got a crowd of followers. He's got a crowd of throng of people that adore him. They're following him. I mean, it's only going to get worse from here. I mean, they think this, they think this makes them mad. Yeah. Pastor mentioned it earlier. I mean, when he comes into Jerusalem, I mean, when he comes into Jerusalem, man, they're throwing their coats on the ground. They're waving yes. the palm branches. They're saying, Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna to the highest. I mean, the religious crowd there went crazy. That's when they said, we're going to kill him. He ain't leaving the city. He's dead man. Some of y'all looking at me like you don't know where I get all this. It's in your Bible. <laughs> Sins. I say to you, arise. 
take up your couch and go to your house. And immediately he rose up before them and took that whereupon he had been laid and departed to his own house glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, We have seen strange things today. Do you get that? Now something very similar is about to happen. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's come through Jericho for the first time. There's a blind man that sits by the roadside begging. you got a city full of priests that ought to know who this man is. They ought to be the ones outside there throwing the palm branches. They ought to be the ones crying out to everybody, this is the Christ. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. But those old religious deadheads didn't say or see anything. But a blind man, yeah. a blind man began to cry out to the inhabitants of Jericho, hey everybody, the Messiah is passing by. The Son of Promise has come. This is the one who's going to rise with healing in their wings. This is the Messiah. And they said, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. He's the Messiah. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. And Jesus stopped and said, all right, let's find out who the Messiah is. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus just stops his procession and says, tell that blind man to come in. Come on. And right in front of all of those unbelieving eyes, eyes that see but see not, Ears that hear and hear not. Come on. Right in front of all of those who were saying he's no Messiah. Don't call him a Messiah. Jesus said, blind man, come here. What would you have me do for you today? <laughs> what would you want for me to do for you today? I wish I had time to preach on a blank check. Because that's what God gave him, a blank check. What would you have me do for you today? He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Listen to what he's asking. He's saying, God, I'm asking you, would you let my physical eyes see what the eyes of my understanding have already seen? <laughs> would you let these physical eyes see what the man, let this man, this flesh, this kid, this tabernacle, let me see on the outside what I already have seen on the inside. Jesus said, by faith, has made you whole. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! He didn't just give him his sight, but you see, it's really a salvation yes, experience. Yes, yes. He's made into a son of God. Yes, amen. Oh. Praise the Lord. Oh. I'm here to tell you, saints, we, 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 we live too much by our poor, pitiful limitations. But what you hear changes what you say. And what you say directly impacts what you see. If you came to this place today saying, I, you know, I, I got trouble seeing how God's going to do this, that, or the other, or how I'm going to do this, that, or the other. I'm telling you, if you'll heighten what you hear, yeah. what you hear will determine what you say. Yes. And what you say will help you to see. Woo. Father, in Jesus' name, Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. I pray now the next few moments that you will work the work of the Spirit in this place. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. It's quite possible that some of you are here this morning on this Palm Sunday celebration. And you're not even saved. Somebody is here that you're not even certain that if you exit this earth where you will spend eternity. You are as the blind man. You are by the way. But God wants to give you an opportunity this morning to get in the way. You see, it is believed that Bartimaeus fell in that throng of people and followed Jesus into Jerusalem and became one of his most honorable and loyal disciples. I'm not going to call anybody out. I'm not going to embarrass anybody this morning. But if you're not here, or if you are here rather, and you've not seen Jesus as the Messiah. But today, the Word of God has been preached and faith comes by hearing. 
You've never seen Jesus as the answer. You've never seen Jesus as the door. You've never seen Jesus as the way. But today, what you heard has given you understanding that you've never had previously. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you leave not by the way, but in the way. I'm not going to embarrass you, but if there's anybody here who would say, Evangelist, Jesus is not the Lord of my life. Jesus is not the first thing I think of in the morning and the last thing that I think of at night. I know there are things, there are activities in my life that are displeasing to Him. And today, I want to be like Bartimaeus. I want to cast aside my beggar's garment. I want to change my identity. I, want to, I don't want to be known as blind anymore. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. here this morning and you see him for the first time in that light, right now I want to pray for you. Would you slip up a hand and say, Evangelist, that's me. Pray for me. Is there one? Come on, I'll take just a moment. I sense the convicting power and work of the Holy Spirit. Is there one here on this celebratory Sunday morning? I was blind, but now I see. How many saints of God are in this place? And you would say, you know what, evangelist? I, I, I've got some challenges in my life. I've got some challenges. I've got some hurdles. I've got some mountains. In recent days, you have either said or at least thought to yourself, remember Jesus knows what you think said or thought to yourself, I just don't see how. I don't see how my marriage is going to make it. I don't, I don't see how my physical health is going to stand up. I don't see how I'm going to be able to pay the bills. I don't see how my children and grandchildren who are lost are going to come to God before it's too late. I don't see how this nation is going to stand in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil. I don't see how our church is going to experience revival and the list goes on. I don't see how. I don't see how. I don't see how. But today, as the word was ministered, you, you heard something and now all of a sudden what you heard is changing. I said it's changing what you see. Maybe it's not changed physically. But it's changed what your spirit man sees. It's changed what the eyes of your understanding see. How many of you this morning will join in? I said, how many will join in? Think about it. Before there was a chorus of celebration on the streets of Jerusalem. Hear this evangelist. Before there was a chorus, a choir of celebration saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Before that ever happened, there was a single solitary blind man who sent the message on. The Messiah comes. The Messiah comes. The Messiah comes. How many saints? Come on. How many of you want to join in with that chorus? Hosanna to God in the highest. The Messiah comes. Come on, saints. All over this house, stand with me. Why don't you lift your hands and lift your voices? Come on. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voices. As the ministry power of the Holy Spirit is here today. Come on. I want to see you. Come on, open me up.
anybody to close your natural eyes? That's your problem. Why don't you close your natural eyes and let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened? I said, close your natural eyes and let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Right now, before Pastor comes, I want him to sing it one more time. Everybody with their natural eyes closed, those of you that would, lift your hands toward heaven and say, God, I limit now my physical vision, but I ask you to expand my spiritual vision. Let my spiritual man see. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says that Abraham is looking, he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. How many of you are looking for God to do something? How many of you are looking for the Lord to return? How many of you are looking for the Spirit of God to move and sweep and revive and change? Come on. Open the eyes.